I'm the notorious sex lady of Rhode Island uh, that Pawtucket has banned. So I had this idea about six months ago of opening a sexual resource center. So I decided to find a location and, and rent some space to have a center for sexual pleasure and health. I was very deliberate in choosing the name of the center because I really feel that the medical communities and the pleasure communities need to work more closely together in order to give a holistic sense of, of self. Um, and I'm a stubborn girl, so I'm not going to give up the name. <laughs> In the original email or the original evites that the space was supposed to be in Pawtucket. We're not in Pawtucket in case you're not from Rhode Island. We're in Providence right now. Pawtucket has banned uh, education from taking place. So we were lucky enough to have the spot, uh, give a round for the spot for donating. <laughs> for donating this space such last minute because last week I came in here in a tizzy um, being denied to provide education in Pawtucket. So thank you The Spot for allowing this space to, to happen. Uh, today we have a lot packed in a short time frame. You are going to have the privilege of listening to some of the most notable sexologists, activists, and sex therapists in the country. They have flown in from Canada, from California, from DC, all to be here with you to provide quality sex education and activist resources. So I want you to utilize the, their services. Dr. Carol Queen is going to be our keynote speaker. And I know, give a round for that, yes. And we are going to have five panel speakers that are going to talk about sexuality issues in America. And it will be, we had some questions that were already submitted to us, but it will be your time to ask any questions that you may want to ask these people, because it's pretty hard to gather all of these um, amazing sexologists in the same room. During the talking event, I do want to let you know that it is open for you to go to the tables, uh, to go back and to, you know, mingle around, see what's up. There's free healthcare services that are in the other room, free hepatitis vaccines, um, talk to doctors that are in the area about sexual health concerns. Um, maybe if you're lucky, you'll get flogged a little bit. There's some uh, spanking resources here. Um, talk about some tantric stuff. So there's lots of options of things for you to do. You can listen to the speakers. You can go into the other room. Don't forget to submit your ticket into the prizes because I have thousands of dollars of prizes that have been donated from our sponsors and a lot of the people that are here which will make you a happy person tonight or tomorrow or next week, so. <laughs> um, this is the difficult part for me. I'm very comfortable asking people, uh, talking to people about clitorises and anuses and you know, sticking things safely up your butt and all those sorts of things. But when it comes to asking for money, uh, I get a little, little, I get a little hivey. I'm just gonna say that. I've decided to take on the fight to keep the, sexual, the Center for Sexual Pleasure and Health open in Pawtucket, and that means I've hired a lawyer. I'm doing this because I fundamentally believe that adults have the right to have sex education. Can you see my hives? Because I can feel them. <laughs> I have... Um, I'm asking for donations for, to, to fund this uh, plan to fight the city of Pawtucket um, to keep the center open. And so I would really appreciate any donations that you could provide. I have some lovely donation people that are waving their hands right now. They've got little uh, milk jugs and they will pass those around. And if you are so inclined to give a donation, that would be lovely. Um, there's also a gorgeous basket that my mother made. Um, <laughs> for this event. Could we hold that basket up? Because she made it by hand. <laughs> yeah. 
She put a lot of time into that. So if you're you you're like, I'd like to put a donation into the pretty basket, please feel free to do that. She is here. She is sitting right over there. She's kind of hiding in a chair. <laughs> Aren't they cute? They're so cute. <laughs> and they raised me to be a proper waspy girl. So look how I turned out. <laughs> so give them, they've been very supportive in terms of all the work that I've done. And I really want to thank them for that. support guys really this couldn't happen if you weren't here today if you hadn't have been sending me emails if you hadn't have been calling me and I know I haven't been calling all of you back but if you hadn't been giving me the support that you've been providing I don't think I could stand here on stage today so thank you all for for what you've been doing um, I am going to turn this over to Dr. Carol Queen and we're going to listen to the fabulous words she has to say so thank you <laughs> Megan, I just want everybody, I know you've been applauding a little bit, but just give this woman some love, would you please? And give her some money. <clears throat> love and money are sometimes separable in our business and sometimes they're inseparable, as I think all of you know. I, first of all, bear greetings from your sister center, the Center for Sex and Culture in San Francisco. And thanks. And uh, my, my cohort, co-founder and partner Robert is here with me today too. Flew in just for this. And I also bring, uh, bring my, uh, my greetings and solicitations, felicitations <laughs> from uh, the Woodhull Freedom Foundation for uh, whom I'm a board member. And uh, if those of you who don't know about Woodhull, it supports sexual freedom as a fundamental human right. I think the linkage with our issue today is crystal clear. And it's uh, Executive Director Ricky Levy couldn't be here, but she wanted me to, she wanted me to represent. So I'm representing and, and uh, sending the thoughts of everyone affiliated with Woodhull to you here as well. It's really awesome to see this many people gathered together. It's great to have seen that people traveled. It's great that your hometown crew is here as well, because that's exactly what it takes, I think, when you tackle something that is not only a social movement level issue, but also by needs has to be an activist issue. It might not have been very activist two or three weeks ago. It's activist now, and I think that's really obvious. Finding out who uh, who the folks are who are making this difficult for Megan will open a door on the people who would like to make it difficult for all of us to do the kinds of things that we do. And uh, while I don't want to spend my entire time with you talking about that, I think it makes uh, no sense to ignore the fact that we still live in a riven cultural environment that isn't all super happy that people, oh, say, want sexual pleasure and want to learn about it. And in fact, want uh, to identify that as a lot of different things. I think when you really, really get down to it, the diversity of experience, of identity, of the kinds of people that we all are coming together here, the people that we serve out in the world, um, just gives some folks hives and um, uh, that's, I think, one of the real reasons that we're here. The notion that we would um, want to educate people to be themselves sexually, give some people hives. So I regret to cause others discomfort, but sometimes we must. So let's go ahead and give them hives and do our work. Um, what I think I really want to remark on today, though, is the way that um, our sexuality and sex education communities are, are, are growing in a way that Several years ago, I think if you had said, well, the next big sexuality center is going to be in Pawtucket, people all over the place, people in, uh, in the, the sex ed and sex therapy worlds, and people all over the place, not just the people in Pawtucket, everyone would have said, no, I, don't, no, I, I can't actually see that happening. And it, it makes me think that 
Instead of us thinking, as I think sometimes we still tend to do, especially those of us who are based to some degree or another on the coasts, that, well, pretty much the sex stuff is in urban areas on the coast, and then there's the rest of the country, and we export our products, and we, we write our books, and it's on the net now, and all of this. I really want to remind people, uh, many of you don't need reminding because you've come from smaller cities, you've come from, from uh, the middle of the, the continent, that... We are everywhere now. We are really everywhere now. And even if there is not a shop, even if there is not a center, even if there's not some sort of open sexual entity in a place, you can't figure out a place where to go on Saturday night to get your spanking, so you have to come here and go in there and get caught up. You aren't uh, sure who else in your neighborhood is making their own webcam situations and putting themselves out on the internet until you know it turns out that they're a policeman's wife and they get arrested. We have of all of us participated in a culture that has sent tentacles out every place. And so it is the communities like Pawtucket, it is the communities all across the country that know now that what we provide in sexuality education, in pleasure education, in sexual identity space provision, helping other people meet people who are the appropriate people for them to meet, helping people understand that each of us has our own distinct sexual identity, those things have become truly a nationwide movement. And I don't think that's going to change. I think it's only going to grow. I think that it's more important now than ever to realize that we're at a generational hinge point. And I say that not only because I paid such attention to how interesting the presidential election last year was and figured that without younger people getting engaged in the political process, the outcome might have been very different. But this, too, is a situation where younger people are coming up having had some access to answers to their questions. Young people getting to college having discovered scarletine, having found a book or a website that, well, some websites continue to raise more questions than, in fact, they answer, since not all pornography is sex education, even though I believe that we are all moved, at least sometimes, to use it as such. And sometimes it works. Sometimes it works out. Then there's the thing where you have to put your legs straight up in the air in order to have an orgasm. And I think that that, in fact, is what has fueled yoga studio growth all around the country. That's my theory. So who knows what the next big thing is going to be? You never know. It's people making pornography, be careful what you throw out in the world. Folks are going to start to copy it right away because they didn't learn anything else in school, now did they? And when people ask me, why do people who are adults and sexual people already need to get sex education, it's all it's natural, isn't it? I mean, I, first I want to quote our colleague Lenore Tiefer who points out that sex is not a natural act, certainly not the way some of us like to have it, but not only that, that we don't learn what we need to learn to communicate, to find pleasure, to find arousal, to optimize it, certainly not to do it with somebody we just met and often not to do it with somebody that we've been with for a long time. We need the information that we didn't get elsewhere. We need support. And we need a community around us that thinks that sexual pleasure is a birthright, should be a norm, should be accessible to everybody else. And that brings me right back around to what Megan is doing in Pawtucket, having to have a little fight about it, granted. But the fight, while will make you learn how to fundraise. I'm sorry. I'm just going to, you know, you're going to have to, you know, as my mother, no, my mother didn't ever give me this advice. Some people's mothers did. They said, just learn to enjoy it, honey. You're going to have to learn how to enjoy fundraising, Megan, is the thing. I mean, you might as well live the best life you possibly can. And if you're going to be fundraising, you might as well get the glow around it, just as you have learned to get the glow around so many other things, or you're a natural. So not only that, but the people out there are going to go, what happened over there in Pawtucket? What's going on? The press is going to talk about this. Certainly, it's going to hit the blogosphere. I know we're all going to help that happen, and many of us have already started to help. If you're not tweeting right now, and you've got your, you know, your shit in your pockets that you can tweet on, please do. Please let everybody know out there that we are here in Rhode Island talking about these issues, and that not everybody here is happy to have us, but that plenty of people are saying, 
Well, it's about time. That place sounds great. That's going to be really fun. I want to I want to go there with my partner. I want to go there to try to find a partner. What are they going to teach us? What all is going on? Really? People do that? They're going to say all that stuff. I know that because that's what they say at the Center for Sex and Culture. It's what they say in places all over the country when I show up to read books or do performance or teach workshops with Robert and, and with my other colleagues. And it's going to get out there that we have a right to this. And you're going to, for the rest of your days, no matter when you decide you might want to sit down and take a break, you're going to be a leader in this movement, Megan. I'm so honored to be here. I'm so happy you're doing what you're doing. I'm so, so pleased to see you all in the room, all our colleagues from the toy companies and the activist companies and the, and the nonprofits and everything. We should have more of these little shindigs. This is a fun day. And I'm going to get off the stage now so we can get on with it. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn the mic over to Ms. Vivian. We're here for sex, right? So come on, get closer, please. Let more people uh, come in and sit down. Cuddle up. Yeah, cuddle up. Hi, everybody. I'm Vivian, and I'm an activist. <laughs> um, and I want to echo what Carol said. What Megan is doing is amazing. When I met with her for coffee a couple of weeks ago and she said she was opening up the center in Pawtucket, my jaw dropped and my eyes widened. And I said, are you kidding? Because we've been trying to do this in Boston for a long time. And so we were so excited. And then when her battles started, um, I'm, I'm so sorry for that on one hand. On the other hand, as an activist, I love a good fight. So. Since Rhode Island, I think, has the biggest, uh, the most sex clubs per capita, what they're doing is a shame. And they should be just totally like embarrassed. So let's everyone help Megan fight the good fight. I, I can tell you, I can tell you that even though your center is broadly based on all types of sex, the New England Leather Alliance and the National Coalition for Sexual Freedom, two very um, interesting and, and vocal organizations are going to be behind you no matter what you do. So we're, you, you're not alone. You're not alone. Um, I'm going to let the panel introduce themselves for a few minutes, and then we're going to open it up for questions. Um, so let's start on that end. Oh, and I brought my writing crop. So if people go too long, <laughs> instead of a gavel. Hi, um, I'm Rebecca Chalker. I sat on the end hoping I'd be last, but you get what you <laughs> you get something in the end. Never mind. Anyway, hi, I'm the author of the Clitoral Truth. Um, in the 19 late 1970s, I worked on a book called A New View of a Woman's Body, which had a chapter on sexuality in it. That chapter ultimately. Uh, redefined women's genital anatomy to bring it up to modern anatomical standards for other organ systems and equal in equity with men's genital anatomy, the penis. Well, I wondered how this material got lost, this information, if it was so important and useful and correct. Who washed the clitoris out of history, out of medical history and out of the popular imagination? Well, that sent me off on a life, uh, 20 year study, if you will. And um, I found out some very interesting things. Freud thought that the, said that, proclaimed that the clitoris was like a pile of pine shavings to set a log of harder wood, i.e. the vagina, on fire. And um, he went in the face of thousands of years of medical knowledge. But that pretty much put the kibosh on the clitoris for most of the 20th century. Until I started um, with my colleagues working on this, and I think the understanding is generally much better now, but you still see what is the last taboo in the media? The C word. And so it's been my lifelong mission to um, to break open this last taboo, and this 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 um, this event, Megan's amazing um, activist work, and the work of all the activists here, is going to make that more um, of a reality. And I'm just so pleased and proud to be here. And thank you very much. 
Hi, I love giving good mic here. Um, <laughs> I'm Gina Ogden. I started out as a marriage and family therapist and very quickly found out that all these people were coming into our clinic with questions about sex and nobody who was supervising me could answer them. So one thing led to another. I ended up with a PhD in sexology and um, found out that although sex was rampant at the institute for Advanced Study of Human Sexuality. Any grads here? Yes. Well, Hear it for the Institute. There was something else notably missing. This was 1977, 8, 9. Um, and that was a women in terms of I mean, women were there, but we were not defining sexuality. So I made it my mission. I felt a mission coming on, and that I would study women, focus on women, and focus on women's sexual health, because back then it was all about dysfunction. I ended up writing a book, I've got a number of books, so one of them is out there, it's called Women Who Love Sex, which came out in an era when uh, people were saying, women who what? Women who love sex too much? You mean sluts and whores and bimbos? And I'd say, thank you. <laughs> you mean me? Okay. Um, and while I was on the road with that book, women were raising their hands and saying, these women are talking about sex, but they're also talking about spirituality. And I thought, great, I'll do another hot book on that, plunged into what turned out to be more than 10 years of research, um, ended up doing a survey on sexuality and spirituality. Guess what? Nobody had ever done one before. Over sex, 700 sex surveys in the 20th century, they all asked the same questions. How many times have you had intercourse uh, per week, month, year? So I asked about the feelings and meanings of sex. Um, almost 4,000 people answered the survey. Their answers are in uh, two books. One is uh, called The Heart and Soul of Sex. The other is The Return of Desire, which is, is taking their answers into desire. I also run workshops everywhere. So pick up some free literature. I'm going to be in Mexico um, in the, in the uh, winter. I'm going to be on a sexuality cruise. I run in case you want some cheap ways to get CEUs. You can get them um, at a teleseminar, which I do. Um, I will be at row running so wonderful uh, circle for for women. So I incorporate this um, work in many, many ways. And my activism, I live in Cambridge, isn't so much out there fighting the police as it is really trying to change people's minds. I worm my way into your mind with a with really what is a new model of how to look at how we experience our sex from a feeling and also spiritual point of view that is not Tantra, it's something else. Ask me questions. Thank you. My name is Barbara Corellis. Uh, I'm the author of Urban Tantra, Sacred Sex for the 21st Century and Luxurious Loving. I'm a sex educator a coach, and I travel around the world teaching workshops. I am also a native Rhode Islander. <laughs> I was born and raised in Newport and Middletown. I know you guys here in Providence Plantations don't think that's part of Rhode Island, but we do. Uh, and I left Rhode Island when I was 18 because I couldn't do the kind of theater I wanted to do, and I couldn't practice the kind of sex I wanted to have. That simple. Um, 
I'm glad I left Rhode Island because it left the whole rest of the world open to me, as opposed to my parents, who have never left the island, save for a doctor's appointment. <laughs> and um, it's an honor and a pleasure and a privilege to be back in Rhode Island supporting something so important, supporting something that might have made the difference as to whether I and other people stayed in this state. The ability to practice sex the way they see fit. My particular por uh, form of Tantra uh, was born out of the AIDS crisis, as was all my work in sexology and all my work in sex and spirit. Um, in the late 80s, I simply had one mission that I could not avoid or get out of my head, and that mission was to find a way for my gay male friends to have hot, ecstatic, passionate, hours-long sex that would rival, with a condom on, that would rival the sex they'd been having in disco palaces, and I knew if we didn't work quickly, they'd all be dead. And this was also the era of sex kills. So in the midst of the worst moment in, in the, um, the sex kills, revolution, I decided we had to reclaim sex from the scrap heap on which it had been thrown, and that has been my mission ever since. I do, I work with everyone. I do have a subspecialty in the queer and kink communities, communities who, thank you. <laughs> communities who have been left out of the search for spiritual sex, because you're doing sex that's so disgusting, how could you possibly consider it sacred? Um, I'm out to reclaim that. <laughs> and doing so successfully on numerous college campuses and university or across the country, thank you, those of you who have invited me, and I see some of you there. It is my dream that we will get to a place where we will learn sex the way we learn math and science and social studies. It doesn't mean that you learn everything about the subject. You couldn't possibly do that in 12 years or in 20. But you learn how to learn. You learn where to go. You learn what's bullshit, what's not, what's well-researched, what's not. You learn how to learn. Sex is left out of this. Now, when's the last time you learned something you learned in algebra class? Decades here. When's the last time you needed to know something about sex? Might our priorities be a little skewed? <laughs> so when the town of Pawtucket makes a decision like they do, I go, that's what happens. That's what happens when you have only graduated the sixth grade in something. You're afraid of it because you're ignorant. And you're ignorant because you weren't allowed to study about it. You weren't allowed to learn. And you have no way to learn because there's no place to learn. So you're afraid of everyone who does it differently from you. And that's why this is happening in Pawtucket. Yes, it's a legal issue. Yes, it's an activist issue. It's also an issue of fear. And we have to treat that side of it as well. So Megan, congratulations. Where are you? Where have you gone? There you are. Thank you. And, and keep up the good fight and know that you're doing it for the healing of so many who live here now and those coming up behind you. Thank you so much. My name is Bill Taverner, and, uh, and I'm so honored to be with uh, so many colleagues that, that I have such respect for. Uh, I, I come wearing many hats, uh, one of which is I'm the, uh, the editor-in-chief of the American Journal of Sexuality Education. And uh, before I get to my prepared remarks, I just wanted to share with you something that happened while I was mingling. And, and that was someone walked up to me and, and saw my tag, and it said, American Journal of Sexuality Education. And he, he, he read it and said, American Journal of Sexuality Education. I got excited that he had heard of it. He said, I I've never heard of it. <laughs> and so I said, thank you for telling me that. And he said, uh, <clears throat> it's sort of like, uh, like the, New the, the New England Journal of Medicine. And I said, not as well read, but more interesting. <laughs> So, uh, so there is a journal that talks about sexuality education, and I'm also the director of the uh, Center for Family Life Education, uh, Planned Parenthood's National Sex Education Program, uh, and uh, also working with QUADES, the Society for the Scientific Study of Sexuality, and we're going to have a big um, uh, event in Puerto Vallarta in November, so check out the table and look up that. Uh, 
But I'm here today because of Megan, and I was so delighted to get this invitation. Um, uh, I hired Megan 10 years ago uh, to come work for the Center for Family Life Education. And um, <clears throat> Megan uh, is one of the most spirited people that I've ever met, one of, the <clears throat> one of the best sexuality educators that I've ever met, and one of the most passionate. And, uh, and, and I remember when Megan would go out and to do classes uh, for, for us, uh, we would get calls frequently for teaching about contraception, te teaching about safer sex and, and, uh, and HIV prevention. And, and one day she said, when do we get to teach about pleasure? And I said, the schools aren't calling about that. Mm -hmm, yeah. and, the, and the reality is that this is so important. Uh, this, this center is so important, and it's the first of its kind. And how exciting to have a center that's devoted to not only sexual uh, health, which is very important, but also teaching about pleasure, which is uh, just as important, if not more so. So I'm very happy to be a part of this. Uh, I was, uh, I have another short story to share with you, and that was um, uh, I was relaying some of um, the trials and tribulations that Megan was going through in, in, um, <clears throat> in opening up the center in, in Pawtucket, uh, and I was telling my wife about it while we were driving to church and with, with my two kids, and uh, so I said, uh, so, so there's this councilman who's calling her on the phone and screaming dildo at her repeatedly. And, and so, you know, I, I guess for a moment I forgot that my kids were in the back seat. They're age 6 and 11. And so in unison, they say, what's a dildo? So I, you know, I, th this is as we're pulling into the church parking lot. And, and so I... I gave up what I thought was a very age-appropriate answer, and I said, it's an object that's often penis-shaped, and it's something that men or women use to feel, make their bodies feel good. They usually touch it on the penis or the vulva or sometimes the anus. And, and I waited for a response, and their response was, dildo, dildo, dildo. <laughs> and while that was so funny, I, you know, I, I thought, where is their mindset? Think about it for a moment. They weren't, they weren't the least bit interested in the definition, right? right. They, they, they were amused. That was such a funny word. And I thought it was an indicator of, of what people, where people are and what they need to learn. And we're, we're assuming you know, that, that uh, you know, the, the whole society is going to break down because two children know the word dildo now. They don't care what it means. They think it's a silly word. And it is a silly word, isn't it? You know, and it's a sign of how we have this sort of uh, bipolar view of sexuality, where we can't, we, we either have to take it very, very, very seriously, where we're talking about STD prevention, and we're talking about condoms, uh, and, uh, or we can talk about sex toys, and we can talk about fun. But we can't talk about both. And, and for me, that is what makes this center so valuable, the integration of both parts. So I really, my, my hat is off to Megan for what she's accomplished here. Thank you. I bet the councilman was off when he was saying the word dildo.